is great to be with you tonight. I'm thankful that you're here, that you're inside and warm, hopefully, or at least warming up. And as we uh, worship this evening, uh, it is a, a special opportunity to really um, dive into the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus talks about uh, how we can leave our gift uh, and then go and reconcile to one another. Uh, when Jesus spoke those words, he was with people in Galilee. And in our gospel lesson, we'll see the words that, that he says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. The interesting thing is that it was about 80 miles from the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem. So that's a 160 mile round trip before there were cars or anything like that. It was inconvenient to say the least. It took a great deal of effort. But that journey to reconcile with one another is perhaps one of the most important journeys that any Christian can make or when we reconcile with our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, it is truly an amazing gift from God to us how our lives can change for the better. As we begin our worship this evening, we'll sing our opening hymn now, hymn number 610, Lord Jesus, Think on Me. That will be our opening prayer, actually. Please stand as we sing it, hymn 610, Lord Jesus, Think on Me. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sin to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. 
Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our intro. We'll chant it with the congregation chanting the Gloria Patri, and uh, you'll follow the same pattern that I do as I chant the song. The Lord has made known his, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy, together be for the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. We continue with the Kyrie on page 152 in the front of your hymnal. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, graciously hear the prayers of your people, that we who justly suffer the consequence of our sin may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the Old Testament reading. Our Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish you shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today 
that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we say our Alleluia verse. Alleluia. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We invite the young people of the congregation up for the children's message. Well, you know what these are, right? These are called offering plates. And of course, when we have an offering, we use the offering plates, and people put their money in the offering, and they present it before God as we place the offering plates on the altar. So they're, they're kind of heavy if you want to feel that, yeah, right? Not too heavy, though. You're strong. So um, as we think about offerings, they're, they're important. It's, it's not just 
money that it's about is because when we give an offering, it's a way of saying to God that we trust God with everything, including our, our financial well-being and, and our lives and everything in them. Money is a big part of our lives, but there's something even more important. And Jesus tells us what that is. He says to the people that if you're presenting an offering before God, and you remember that you're not getting along with someone, that maybe you said something or did something, or they said something or did something, or maybe you both said something or did something, and now you don't get along, that that is, you know, perhaps at that time even more important than giving an offering to, to go and, and to say I'm sorry and to say I forgive you to one another. And it's hard to do sometimes to say I'm sorry and I forgive you, isn't it? But it's very, very important. We talked about that that was a long journey that they would have had to do if, if they lived up in Galilee and had to go all the way to Jerusalem and they had to go all the way back home and then all the way back to Jerusalem and all the way back home. That's a lot of walking. <laughs> that's not easy, but that's how important it is to live with the love and forgiveness that was first shown to us by God in Jesus Christ. So let's have an echo prayer. Ready? And repeat after me congregation can help. Dear Jesus, help me to make things right with others by saying I'm sorry and I forgive you. Help me to remember that all this is possible because you love me and forgive me. Amen. Thank you very much. Yep, yeah, they're, they're on the inside. I'll tell you about that. It's kind of hard to see, but um, yeah, there's they're three letters, right? Uh huh. And um, so uh, these, these letters. Remind us that Jesus, it kind of is, uses the Latin words, but it reminds us that Jesus is the Son of God, our Savior. That's what those letters stand for. So in case you look at the bottom of the offering plate ever and see the IHS, that's what that's all about. All right, so uh, you can go back to your seat now and we'll continue with our sermon hymn.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearest brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, the part of Matthew's Gospel that we have for our Gospel lesson in the text for this sermon today is from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus spoke. And the Sermon on the Mount, whether you know it or not, is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture because it always seems like Jesus is preaching directly to me. And indeed, he is, for Jesus still speaks through his holy word today to you and to me. And the crowds that overheard Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount to the disciples, many in the crowds did not believe in Jesus yet. And it is only through faith in Jesus that we can partake of the blessings of being brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. As we begin this sermon, to jump to the chase and tell you what we're talking about, I'll say this. When we see ourselves as those who are believers and part of the family of faith, it changes the dynamic, the, the very nature, the, the power that is present in our relationships with one another. On the other hand, when we look at others only from an earthly point of view, when we magnify the speck in their eye, we don't just limit ourselves in our estimation of them, but we also limit the good that can come about from having them present in our lives. Present through God's redeeming, forgiving, restoring power. And so as Jesus preaches this Sermon on the Mount, he states the obvious. If you murder someone, you are liable for judgment. Still to this day, we have things like life in prison or the death penalty. However, Jesus takes that commandment not to murder, the fifth commandment, and he extends that commandment, like he does with all the others, to their moral and logical point of intersection in the lives of those who have not, perhaps literally, taken another's life. In other words, we are guilty of murder in God's eye, even if we are merely angry with one another. Now, this seems like an impossibly high standard, and it is impossibly high for us to keep, because who hasn't been angry? However, the anger that Jesus is speaking of isn't merely a failing to reach a certain standard of righteousness. It is a failure to be sure, but more than that, it is a sin event, an action of rebellion, a breach of God's holy law, and something that is destructive to relationships both human and divine. Therefore, as Jesus speaks, there is a definite progression. If murder is bad, to say the least, so is sinful anger. And if sinful anger is bad, so is saying raka to our brother. The, the ESV translates this as insulting our brother. And if insulting someone is bad, and it is, so is someone being called a fool by us. At the same time as we see this progression, there is another progression going on. The level of punishment is increasing. 
It goes from being liable to judgment, to being liable to the council, to being liable to the hell of fire. This drives home the point that we need reconciliation. If your brother has something against you, you must try and leave everything behind, even your offering at the altar, and go and make things right. Or they may take you to court even, and you may face the possibility of never getting out of jail, never even getting to the last penny that must be paid putting your fate into the hands of the courts is not always the best of ideas. As we talk about anger and sinfulness, we need to be careful lest we water down or try to water down what Jesus is saying. Case in point, when we appeal to what is known as righteous anger, to be fair, we have examples of Jesus throughout his lifetime acting in a rather angry way, such as when he drove out the money changers and cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. It's rather a dramatic action. And we see God, Jesus, speaking in his holy word in the book of Proverbs, calling out foolish behaviors one after another even in psalms it declares the fool says in his heart there is no god and jesus himself in matthew's gospel matthew 23 verse 17 calls the scribes and pharisees blind fools also in scripture, we see that Paul, as he's setting up a hypothetical case of a person who might be questioning how God can raise the dead, in that case, Paul even calls this person, you foolish person. Of course, Paul wasn't talking to a real person even, and only a hypothetical one. Aside from that, we have basically God, and God alone being the one to call out such foolish behavior. And I think that we can agree right here and now that, that we can allow God to do that. God has a right to say what is and isn't foolish. He has the right, in fact, to the final word as to what is foolish or not. However, when we are rude or insulting or hurtful in our words towards one another, there is a certain arrogance to that that is particularly offensive. Perhaps you might argue with that, or perhaps we might be numb to it or blind to it when we are guilty of it. But the fact remains that it is wrong because hurtful words arise from the same bitter and angry root as physically hurting or harming or even killing a person. To get around that, another passage that people sometimes point to is this one from the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. This psalm is picked up by St. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, when he says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. One could, I suppose, get the mistaken impression from those two verses that, in fact, anger is commanded. We better get angry. But that is not 
the point of either passage. If we carefully read the fourth psalm, it speaks a warning to us. And it speaks of our own hearts and our own need for repentance before God. This sense is carried out in the King James translation of Psalm 4, verse 4, which says, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. There is great wisdom that not many people talk about in being able to have the kind of godly self-control where we do not blurt out whatever we happen to want to say just to get even or to push other people down. And what Paul is saying is not that we're supposed to be angry, but that when we do get angry, we need to not remain angry for very long at all. Instead, we are to take our anger before God and entrust Him with whatever situation we find ourselves in. The alternative is somewhat akin to putting ourselves in a life long prison of bitterness. I don't know if you saw this, came across my Facebook feed, maybe because I like football, I don't know. Sometimes I think my computer listens to me and my son and I were talking about football the other night and so this thing pops up on Facebook, right? And it's about, about Mark Gastineau and it was about how Mark Gastineau uh, claims that Michael Strahan stole his sack record in the NFL when Brett Favre allegedly took a dive in the final game of the 2001 football season. Now this still bothers Mark Gastineau and he's now 62 years old and he says it's always on his mind. Even though at the time he was at that game and he congratulated Strahan. I think there was a failure to communicate somehow. But when we let our anger spill out into our lives and others with words that hurt. Scripture is very clear about the danger. Take, for example, the book of James with its vivid warning about the tongue. It says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. As I bring up that verse, I would be terribly remiss if I did not add one thing to it, and that is this. As important as it is for me to preach it to you, it's even more important for me to take those words to heart. I think that many pastors, we find ourselves in a situation where we secretly wish that we could just say whatever we wanted to anybody and get back at them. We even secretly wish that, that we could just go up and maybe swear up a storm at them or, or hit them with a zinger or two that would put them in their place. It seems like people say whatever they want to say to us. Why can't we do the same? Well, I'll tell you why. Because at the beginning of that chapter, this is what James says to pastors and teachers. He says, 
Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So even as I'm preaching these words to you, I better look at them in my own life first and foremost. Let me tell you that. Okay. Inasmuch as anger is an emotion, it may be unavoidable, but we must guard against it and deal with it very carefully. Perhaps a good place to start is by going to books such as the book of Amos in the Old Testament. It begins with judgment on Israel's neighbors, all of the neighbors that have been a pain in their side and caused them grief and trouble and tribulation. For in the book of Amos, judgment is spoken. Spoken against Damascus. It's spoken against Gaza and Tyre and the Edomites and the Ammonites and the Moabites. And God says things like, I will send a, a fire upon Moab and it shall devour the stronghold of Kerioth. And roars of exaltation must have resounded in the tents of Israel. However, you would open your Bibles to Amos and just turn the page from there. You would see something that would make your blood run cold. All of these judgments against Israel's neighbors are only preliminaries because God's real beef is with Judah and with Israel. And in these judgments, Amos is unrelenting. His words are pointed. Hear this word, it says, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. The Lord your God is sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish Quite succinctly, and even more frightening, are the words of Amos 4, verse 12, which simply say, Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Amos might be called a minor prophet, but he sure has some major things to say. And although there is judgment in Amos, even in Amos, there is a word of hope. It says something that, in a way, echoes our Old Testament lesson for today. It says, seek good and not evil, that you may live. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. One of the things, and I told you I love the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that I love about the Sermon on the Mount is that even though Jesus preaches the law, he still provides hope for the hopeless. The Sermon on the Mount is a sermon especially relatable to those who have been crushed, to those that have been rejected, to those that have suffered, to those that the world despises. Just look at the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. On my account, Jesus really did command us in the Sermon on the Mount to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Some think that would be a sign of weakness, but we know better. And Jesus lovingly reminds us not to be anxious because he promises that God will clothe us and provide for us. And Jesus tells us, as I mentioned at the introduction to this sermon, not to judge others and point out the speck in their eye, but 
Rather, we are called to see things more clearly. And Jesus tells us to build our house upon the rock so that when the rains fall and the wind blows, we have a sure foundation. In all of this, Jesus was speaking with authority and he was speaking personally. For he, Jesus, would personally experience the wind and the rain of human rejection and abandonment. He would be put to death for sinful people such as us to pay for the sins of the world, sins of people such as you and I. He knew, Jesus knew the sting of insult. He knew the sting of being considered a fool. He knew the sting of being condemned and judged by others, only he had no sin, no guilt. Rather, he died for those that do. And he rose from the dead so that God declares to you and me and all who believe in Jesus that our sins are forgiven. And in Jesus, God has been gracious to us in the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. What costly grace has so freely been given to you and to me? For we can look to the great lengths that Jesus went to to win you for God. We can look to the great lengths that Jesus went to to clothe you with his righteousness and look to the great lengths that Jesus went to to assuage God's righteous and holy anger for your sin and mine. We can look to the great lengths that Jesus went to so you and I being reconciled to God could be sure of God's eternal love for us. Truly a love without limits. And the reconciliation provided for us by Jesus has broken every barrier down. For in Jesus, God has come to terms with us. And this is how God sees us as a people who are forgiven and made new. What does this mean? This means that you and I are empowered by the Holy Spirit and by God's redeeming love to actively pursue reconciliation with others, to make the journey of reconciliation. To fail in this would make our lives so much poorer and impoverished and to think that we could not even attempt to reconcile with others would be a great tragedy. To think that we have other people all sized up and all figured out and simply then just to write them off and out of our lives would be egregious. Now, maybe sometimes we don't know any better, but we can still learn. I had a very powerful illustration of this this last week. I was teaching for my wife her confirmation class at school. And as I was going through my confirmation lesson there, I was um, teaching them to memorize a Bible verse. And after a few times, repeating that Bible verse through with the class. I had them say it, and I said, good job. Well, at that time, Karen had been walking into the room, and I think perhaps because she was comfortable enough with me, and because she is the good teacher that she is, she said, no, that wasn't good. Do it again. <laughs> and you better believe that her class did it again. And this time, they did a whole lot better. You know, part of that is the amazing teacher that she is, and part of it is that she spent time to be with them, and she believed in them. Even when others might write them off. Even when this whole world might say, you're no good, 
my wife, their teacher, believed in them that they could do far better than this poor preacher thought they could. And she was absolutely right. Think what kind of difference that makes in a young person's life. And what if we could do that in our dealings with others? as we seek to bring about reconciliation where none thought possible. And so, I would like to encourage you as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ with a simple challenge in your lives to make that journey, a journey without limits, the journey of reconciliation. Amen. Let us stand now as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we worship the Lord through our offering. We invite you to stand as we join our hearts in the prayer of the church. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to reconcile the world to yourself and to make peace by the blood of his cross. Give us courage to seek forgiveness and reconciliation with one another, that your peace that surpasses all understanding would rule our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, there are many divisions in your church. Too often we have identified ourselves as those who follow earthly leaders rather than as those who follow Christ. Bring unity where there is division, peace where there is discord, and reconciliation where there is conflict. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, strengthen all marriages, encourage those who are single, and help us to recognize the value of each person. For all have been redeemed by Christ, the crucified and risen one. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, bless all pastors, DCEs, teachers, church planters, missionaries, musicians, and servants in your church. Embolden them as they plant and water good seed in your kingdom. We humbly ask you to provide growth where and when you will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, look with favor upon all who are sick, injured, and recovering. We pray for all of our loved ones and all that we name in our hearts. Have mercy upon them and heal them according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we commend all of these things to your infinite mercies, which are new every morning. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated and are invited forward to the sacrament of the altar. We invite you to stand. May this true body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you and strengthen you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Will you remain standing as we sing our final hymn? It sounds very Christmassy, and I suppose it is. It also speaks of the joy of reconciliation in Jesus Christ and uh, shows that Jesus is the one who has come to bring us that peace and that joy that are only found in him. We sing joy to the world. May God be with you until we meet again.